Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I have one of our most requested guests. His name is Lawrence King. Lawrence, how's it going, man? It's going great, my friend. Very pleased to be here. Big fan of, uh, of your account on Twitter. And uh, for those that requested me, thank you very much. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Absolutely. Where are you calling in from today? At the moment, I'm living in Asuncion, Paraguay. Yes. Yeah, so you're very famous for uh, being based up in Paraguay and also in Uruguay and touting the benefits of these countries. For people that don't know about you, um, you know, you're, you're probably one of the legends of money Twitter. You're a Udemy professor with over 17,000 students. You're the owner of Raging Bull Coffee. Uh, a, a great coffee brand. Uh, tell us, uh, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Um, well, I mean, you've, you've pretty much hit it in a nutshell there. Um, but in another nutshell, when I first started making money on the internet back in 2012, I didn't feel comfortable giving half my money to the government. Um, you know, maybe if they wanted 10, 20%, we could have negotiated something, but half was a bit too much. So I discovered that I could move to a tax haven, and I did just that in 2013. I moved to Uruguay when they just freshly opened their their new tax um, mm -hmm. benefit system for, for foreign entities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved there. I've been living in South America ever since. It's my favorite place in the whole world. I mean, everything you could ever want is in South America, whether it's tropical beaches, lakes, sea, mountains, you know, anything that you want, cold, hot, tropical, whatever you want, you've got it here. So it's definitely one of my favorite places in the world. And uh, I was a, a very big fish on Amazon. It was one of the biggest supplement sellers between 2012 to 2018. And uh, then got into social media and agency-based stuff over the last four or five years. And I grew a Twitter following, God knows how. Um, I did that, but I managed it somehow. <laughs> And uh, that's that's pretty much it, really. Yeah, it's it's a hell of a story. And uh, you've done a couple podcasts before. They're hard to find, but they're out there. And so I don't want to do a rehash of that. But I think it is valuable for people to kind of get your whole timeline because it's, it's something that, you know, is hard to, to demonstrate in, in over Twitter. Um, but maybe you could just run us through kind of uh, how you went from, uh, you know, I guess the decision to move out of your house at 16 and then from Italy to Venezuela, to China, to Vietnam, and, and then to Latin America. Okay. Well, I always knew as a child growing up in the UK, I always knew something was wrong because I thought the rest of the world can't, the weather can't be this bad. The food can't be this bad. The lifestyle <laughs> can't be this bad bad essentially do you know what i mean especially as a man as a woman i think you have a bit of an easier time in the uk as a man it's a it's one of the worst places really i would say for quality of life um you live to work you don't see the sun hardly ever dating life is not great especially if you're a man and i always felt it was something wrong even at a very young age i don't know eight nine years old i thought this isn't right and i remember i used to go to friends houses um, who were, you know, foreigners, Italians, Greeks, and their mother would look nice. She'd wear a nice dress. She'd cook this incredible meal. And I thought, there's something more out there, isn't there? There's got to be. And I went, when I was eight, I got essentially kicked out the home as they do in, in the UK and America. It wasn't that my dad's a bad person. It's just that that culturally is very normal, which I think is shocking, but mm -hmm. uh, very normal in the UK and USA to kick your kids out 16, 18 I think a lot of parents fall for the meme that they're doing their kids a favor when in reality, all they're doing is putting them behind five to 10 years because they're going to be in, they're going to have to pay rent and be in so much debt and work a low paying job that it takes them so long to actually get where they could be if they just had the right support at home. So again, that's not a criticism of my dad. That's just socially a normal thing where I come from. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, not definitely. I was, I had a great, I've got a great father. So not doing the whole sort of woesy me, uh, spiel there. Um, from there, I went to Italy with a backpack at 18. And as soon as I arrived, I knew I was correct. The women were way more attractive. The food was better. The sun was out. And I thought, yes, 
the UK is not normal. <laughs> so I decided that whatever it would take, whether it meant sleeping in the streets or teaching English or whatever I had to do, I was going to stay in Italy and I was not going to go back to the UK. And I didn't go back to the UK apart from the odd visit after that point. Mm -hmm. And you did uh, some modeling in Italy, which is where it all, uh, where your, your career as a handsome man kicked off. I did. Yeah. I was a fortunate, fortunate, handsome man card. And uh, also, I don't know if you remember the film Twilight. Do you remember that film? Mm -hmm. I looked just like the vampire. So I had loads of modeling gigs um, for that, you know, vampire related club nights, clothing brands wanted like vampire looking guys, like tall, skinny, long hair, very pale. So I had a lot of work. Um, and then what happened was the second film came out and it was the wolf. They wanted the wolf. Now they didn't want the vampire anymore. So my work went, <laughs> went straight down. I was, I was gone. I was, I was, my work didn't dry up, but I certainly wasn't working as much as, uh, as I had been during the, the peak of the twilight era, but it was a fun time for sure. And were you in like a, a modeling house or something with like bunk beds? No. No, I just got called for gigs um, and, you know, very often it was very popular back then for clubs to do like vampire theme nights. So they would want me to model for the poster of the club uh, mm -hmm. or clothes, clothing brands, you know, were kind of had that sort of vampire look, you know, so they would, they would hire me for that. I was, I was not a big time model by any means. And uh, once the Twilight stuff dried up, I became, you know, those budget models on AliExpress and things like that. I became one of those in China. Wait, but that's skipping ahead because from Italy, you went, from my understanding, uh, you went from Italy straight to Venezuela. Wow, you really did your research. Yes, that's correct. Yes. So when I was in Italy, I got promised a job teaching English in Venezuela. And when I went there, I was a very young guy. I, f I found out that there was no job for me. So I was sat in the, in like a square and I saw this guy, he had like a problem with his legs and he was selling juice uh, and he was selling nonstop juice, right? It was like, uh, I guess it would be like Kool-Aid in America, that sort of stuff. You know, the stuff that you, it's not juice. You, you know, the sort of it was, powder. It was Kenya, Kenya cane juice. No, that's what I sold. Yeah. But this guy was yeah. selling, Okay. this guy was selling like, um, I don't know what it would be in America, you know, like Kool-Aid where you put the... Right. Was the, it the icy one, Raspado? Like the powder, you know, the powder they put in, Tang. Okay. <laughs> tang it's called. Okay. Um, so he was selling this anyway. And I saw him doing that and I thought, okay, I need to do something because I don't, I'm, I'm not in a position where I can call my dad and get help. So I have to figure something out. And I saw he was selling this Tang and I thought I could sell something. And I was renting a small apartment um, and the guy had a cane juice machine, the guy who owned the house. And I said to him, could, could I rent that? And he said, yeah, sure. So I rented it and he said, I'll even help you go get the cane. And I thought if he can sell juice, I can sell juice. So I sat on the main street, 22 years old, roughly selling cane juice in Venezuela. And that was kind of like my first ever business. That was when I realized if you just sell what people want, and you you are in front of these people, you will make money. Yep. And I, I heard that this was on the Carretera Nacional, which is like the highway. Was this in Caracas or another city? No, I was in Barinas. I was in the city of Barinas. So I was just, okay. yeah, sat on the Carretera Nacional, no t-shirt on, just selling juice all day. And people would stop their cars just to talk to me and figure out why I was even there in the first place. And I, honestly, in those times... The dollar was like six with the believer. It's like, God knows what it is now. And I was probably making 50, 50 to a hundred dollars a day, which in Venezuela, especially there was, was big money. And mm -hmm. one thing I learned doing that, selling that juice, I realized that people always have a perception, you know, like that meme that says, oh, if you don't, the teacher tells the students, if you don't study, you're going to end up like this guy. And the guy is a construction worker making like six figures. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would come to my stall and talk to me like I was broke because I was selling something. 
And I realized then that everything really is perception. If you're seen selling something, people think you're broke. Broke people think you're broke. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, he needs to sell something. Oh, he's selling in the street. He must be broke. When really I'm making a lot more money than the average person. Yeah. And um, Lawrence, I, I want to go through just like the, the timeline of how you went from country to country because you did a bunch of very drastic moves. And then after that, we can come back and kind of double click on, on things because I know we uh, only have kind of like an hour here. So how did you go then from, I think, basically from Venezuela directly to China? So, I, yeah, I went from Venezuela back to Europe for a little bit. Um, uh, things started getting a bit difficult. The it, things were a bit difficult under Chavez. And I went to Europe. And then from there, I got an offer to do modeling again in China. So I went to China and I lived in China for about a year, year and a half. And you said again, was that like your second time in China? No, that's the first time. Okay. I went to Europe again okay, okay. and then first time to China. Got gotcha. And then from China on, so you're doing the modeling. I want to double click on all these things, but I do want to run through the timeline. And then you got to Vietnam. You met Adrian, your your mentor in Vietnam. Tell us That's about correct. that. So yeah, I was in Vietnam and I was struggling financially. I wasn't doing so well. I was just doing bits and pieces to survive. I was 24, 25 at this time. So really I got into online business quite late. Back then there wasn't really, it wasn't like now. I mean, these these 20 year olds are so lucky. I, I really hope they realize how lucky they are. They can literally go on Twitter and find all these different business opportunities and people making money that it didn't exist back then. So if you were going to get into online business back then, you really had to know somebody who knew somebody that was doing something and then they had to want to tell you. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different ball game. And I rented a house for this, this guy from the UK. He was in his sixties. His name was Adrian. And he, I did a good job negotiating the deal because I would do bits and pieces like that just for extra cash. So I negotiated his rental and got commission and he called me up and he said, can we talk? Can we go out for coffee? And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, oh, um, I'm making $20,000 a month on Amazon and I need a young person's help because I'm, I need, I've got loads of things to do. The business is taking off. And this is funny because I see this a lot on Twitter. I was broke back then. So when he told me that he made 20,000 a month, I'm sure you can guess what my first reaction was. Damn. Well, yes, but then I also thought, no, you're not. Nobody makes 20 grand in a month. That's impossible. Because that's how broke people think, right? They, they don't, mm -hmm. they, they've never seen it. They've never been around it. So they don't believe it's possible. You see that a lot on Twitter. When you see someone on Twitter or social media say, this guy never made, he, he doesn't make 10K a month. It's because 10K a month is like a lot of money for them. So it's kind of like it, it shows in your, in your outlook. So he told me and I thought, oh, there's no way he makes 20 grand a month. And he said, look, I want to employ you, but I need, I was already had a job. He said, I need you to work nights because we sell in the USA. So you're going to have to, you know, and I said, yeah, Night sure. Shift. Okay. Uh, so I had to work double shifts basically. Yeah. With him. And then I saw his business and I realized, oh, this guy actually genuinely does make 20 grand, more than 20 grand a month. And mm -hmm. very quickly, we went from 20,000 to like 250,000 a month together. And my life changed from there. That was Venezuela selling juice was when I realized, oh, I can actually sell stuff and make more than a job. Good. And then Vietnam was when I realized, oh, you can actually make tons of money on the internet. You can sell things that people want to buy and make tons of money. Mm -hmm. And what, what city in Vietnam were you in at that time? I was in Ho Chi Minh City. Okay. And um, yeah, I mean, take us from there, kind of how you went uh, from Vietnam to Latin America. So with Adrian, we grew this business out. And my salary went up. So for the first time, I was making six figures. I was 26 years old. And I was making six figures for the first time ever. And unfortunately, one day he woke up, he had a tumor. And he moved to Thailand, because Thailand has some of the best hospitals in Asia. And we both moved into the hospital together, because he was in like a five star hospital, sort of like a five star hotel room. 
mm. and we worked on the business together. Um, and I stayed there with him until he passed away. And when he passed away, his wife was going to continue the business. And I spoke to her and she said, yeah, no problem. Everything's going to be fine. I know we owe you quite a lot of money. Um, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. And I said, okay, well, in that case, I was only really sticking around for Adrian. I'm going to move to Uruguay because I want to fix my tax situation. And she said, yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it. We got you, all the rest of it. I go to Uruguay. I do a month of work and then the payments don't come through. And she says to me, oh, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. And then I wake up one day, I'm blocked. I'm blocked from the Amazon account. I'm blocked from PayPal. I'm blocked on Skype. I'm blocked on everything, right? So that was when I realized, oh, I'm in big trouble here. I need to figure something out. And I didn't have that much money really in the swing of things for someone with no income that's just moved to a new country, paid for a lease, bought furniture, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I thought in my mind that everything was going to be okay. And uh, I was starting from zero again. Wow, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize how that that uh, situation ended up. Yeah. So from there, I basically thought, okay, the only thing I know that I can do to make money is Amazon. So I'm going to use all the funds that I have, and I'm going to launch a supplement company. And I launched a supplement company um, on Amazon again, started in Europe, and then eventually went to America. And I got down in my bank. I remember I got down to minus... Minus 4,500 pounds. And I remember one month I had to choose between paying the electricity or paying what we have here in South America, which is the communal expenses for buildings, because I didn't have enough to pay both. And it was 2000, end of 2013, I had my breakthrough month where I managed to walk away with like 20,000 profit. And then from there, I just had a great run on Amazon for a few years where I was just one of the first people to be involved in the supplement industry and, and be able to ride that wave. And uh, I managed to make sure that everything was okay from there on. I was, I was, it was literally make or break. It, there, I was so close to not making it, like really, really close. And it was like a huge wake-up call for me because I'd gone from being broke – to working with Adrian, making six figures, making this money, to being basically broke again, where I would go into a supermarket and hope my card would get passed. And mm -hmm. I just told everyone that I was moving to this tax haven because I'd made it and I was successful now. And here I was in a supermarket in Uruguay hoping that my card would get passed for a $10 purchase. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's, it's very, it, it can happen very quickly either way. You know, you in a couple of months can really make the big difference whether you're going up or down. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I heard that basically what happened was your accountant, told, like, you know, you had the, the tax bill come in. You had to give your 45% to the queen. Yep. Uh, and your your accountant, what did he tell you and how and what action did you take that, that basically? Yeah, so basically, I was when I was in uh, Vietnam, I was still registered in the UK. So they wanted some of my money because for the first time I'd started making money and I'd never paid tax before because I'd never really made that much. So I said to him, I got an accountant and he said as a joke, oh, well, if you don't want to pay this stuff, you can move to, I don't know, Uruguay. And that was about a month before uh, he, we, we'd started working together about a month before. And then when he told me that, he told me that like on a Sunday, I don't remember the exact days, but a couple of days later I was in Uruguay. Like he told me that on like Sunday and the, via email. And then Thursday I was there and I said, okay, I'm in Uruguay. What do I do now? And he said, man, you're really crazy. You are really crazy. And he said, there's nothing I can do for you. You need to get a, a very good a local accountant that can help you set up your business and all the other stuff. But yeah, in a couple of months time, you'll no longer need to pay the UK tax. And so we're recording, uh, in, in Q4 2022, when was it that, that you first arrived in Uruguay? So it was 2013, probably, probably mid 2013 around that time. And, uh, my understanding is that Uruguay has a, a 10 year tax break. And so you must be sort of approaching the 10 year mark 
Uh, is that sort of why maybe I'm guessing you started moving some of your operations to Paraguay to, to sort of, because is, is, is Uruguay sort of winding down for you? It had a good run, but. No, for me, Uruguay is, is number one. And luckily I've been able to fix it with my accountant where I'd left for two years. I went to Chile mm-hmm. and then I came back. So that took it, 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 it gets recounted again. They've managed to fix that for me. So I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about the time frame. Mm-hmm. Because everything is fixable. That's one thing you start learning when you do leave your country and you move to a tax haven and you change your situation. You realize that everything's fixable. And it's normally only for the top 1% that everything's fixable. But when you change country, you realize, you know, you can fix stuff the way you want it to. So that uh, Uruguay will always be my base um, because their banking is just phenomenal. I have moved mm-hmm. large amounts of money with no problems, no issues safe very safe very good banks all the mainstream banks and uh i prefer that the reason i'm in paraguay is because i met my girlfriend here we're having a child together and this is just a very good base for for living it does have tax benefits as well um but for me i personally for the tax stuff i prefer uruguay Makes sense. You just value the the stability and 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 all that. Yeah, it's it's what I know as well. I've been doing it for so long. I know the entire process. I know when the tax season ends. I know exactly what to do, and it's just what I'm comfortable with. I find that the life in Uruguay is not as fun as other countries. You know, it's a small country with a very small population. Very good people. Don't get me wrong, but the there's just not as much stuff there. There's not as much restaurants, things to do. So it's not mm-hmm. as much fun as, say, Paraguay or Brazil or Argentina. So it's a very good base to 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 sort of do some deep work, um, and and be a tax resident. Absolutely, and we are going to get into that. Uh, I was talking to the OG Vance, who's in Asuncion right now, and I asked him. I said, "What should I ask Lawrence when I get him on the podcast?" And he said, "Well." He said, well, Lawrence is one of the only guys that's really spent significant time living in Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, Chile, Argentina. You've lived in all of them, like at least six months or a year in basically everywhere in the Southern Cone, right? Yeah, I've lived in Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, Uruguay, and Brazil. And so, um, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to come back to the Venezuela thing, but I had a, uh, and, and I also want to do a deep dive a little bit on, on your perspectives on different countries. Um, but I had a, a couple of questions. So one, one theme I noticed was that you really did like burn the boats, drastic moves every single time. So it was UK to Italy, which is reasonably drastic. And then Italy to Venezuela, which is a huge move. And then, uh, you know, you went home for a bit, but basically Venezuela to China, which is an enormous move, China, Vietnam, and then Vietnam to Uruguay, which is another enormous move. So what's kind of your philosophy on, on you know, burn the boats and, yeah, I mean, uh, doing, doing big things? That's a really great question. Um, to be honest there, I would say mess up as much as you can in your 20s. Take those risks in your 20s because who cares? You know, if I sold cane juice in Venezuela – you know, some people for a year, most, some people might look at that as, um, a wasted year. I don't because I learned a lot of skills and I got to, you know, get a base on Spanish, but you can waste a year in your twenties. You can make a mistake. You can move to the wrong country. You can take the wrong possibility and it's fine. There's nothing, you know, you learn from it. If it goes wrong, you just learn, you know, when I went to Venezuela and I didn't actually have a job lined up that I thought I did, I just learned, I learned tons of stuff. Um, so you can't really lose in your twenties. The problem is when you get into your thirties, like me now, if I wanted to randomly go to China for no reason, I would look like a loser. Do you know Mm. what I mean? People be like, who's this, who's granddad over here? What's he doing? Why is he, (laughs) do you know what I mean? Why is he taking a few hundred dollar modeling gigs to, to pay the bills? So, you know, do that stuff in your twenties and burn the bridges. Absolutely burn the bridges. No way back. Burn the boats. Don't burn bridges, but burn boats. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, burn the boats. Yes, yeah, you're right. You know, but burn, burn the boats so that you can, you can basically go. I have to make this work. I have to learn the language. I have to do this. And I think that's one of the reasons why most people never get their online business off the ground because they don't burn the boat at all. 
So they just treat their online business like it's some sort of plus, some sort of bonus, some sort of, you know, oh, one day, like the lottery almost. They don't really treat it like, so when you move to another country and it's, you have to make this work or you don't eat and you're going to be homeless in some other country where you don't even speak the language, there's a lot of pressure to either make or break. Mm -hmm. So, and you said you were in Barinas, Venezuela, which I'm looking at a map. It's kind of near Merida, but it's extremely far from the, it's extremely inland. Like that is, you, you definitely were like the only gringo there at that point in time. I was, yeah. Well, there were a lot of Italians. A lot of Italians had gone there um, in the 80s and 90s. So there were quite a few Italians. Um, but yeah, I was the only, you know, I was the only sort of, I guess, gringo. In, in and what, the, what the, made you stay in Venezuela? Like, cause I guess you could have been like, ah, it didn't work out. I might as well just take the bus and maybe make my way to Medellin or something, something more comfortable. I think it's a pride thing because I told everyone that I was moving to Venezuela and I had this great English teaching job. I'm very much the same when I moved to Uruguay. I told everyone I was doing really well with my job and I was going to move to Uruguay to be tax free. And then the next thing you know, I'm struggling again and I brought it back. I managed to make it, but I think it's important to stick things out. Because if you're one of the kind of people that goes, oh, it's difficult, and you just run, you're going to run every time. Mm. You know, if you can, if you, it's, it's character building. If at 22 years old, I could go to a very unstable country um, and, and make it work, then everything becomes easier after that. Yeah, that's a good philosophy. Um, yeah, let's do a think- question because it, you go ahead, go ahead with your thought. I was just going to say as an extra point, that's why it's so important to suffer and fail in your 20s. Definitely. So it sounds like, uh, you know, the the motivating factor around a couple of your moves was because you had told people at home your plans and you wanted to, you know, make them proud. One question that we, I, I'm going to ask on every single podcast episode going forward, I really like it, is have any of your friends actually visited you or whatever happened to like your, your high school UK buddies? That's a really great question. So, I mean, one, one thing I started noticing around 20 years old was that a lot of my friends, or even 19, 18, they were going to university or as you would say in North America, college. And I would watch them come back on summers and things like that. And they were all, they were all going very they were going rapidly downhill because a lot of people become alcoholics at college. It's basically just one big excuse to party. You turn up for these classes and then you leave it maybe with some sort of degree that might be useful. And I looked at them and I thought the way they're going and the kind of lifestyles they're living, they're, they're going to be toast by the time they're 30. And I thought I have to do something different. I really do. You know what I mean? And I have to, break this somehow. And my friends all laughed at me through every bit of the journey. And now, with, especially with the last two years, and obviously we can't go too much into that, they all, they all say to me, you were right. They finally get it. They finally get it. But the problem is most people wake up too late and they wake up in their early to mid thirties with two kids, with a wife that they'd never wanted to be with in the first place. And they're whole life revolves around going out on Friday night, Saturday night with the boys and getting as drunk as they can to forget their existence. And that's something I wanted to avoid. And uh, for, for the L- Lawrence King fans, uh, I believe you're from London or where do you want to shout out maybe your specific neighborhood or, or where you're from in the UK? Yeah, <laughs> sure. So I'm from Wandsworth, London is where I'm originally, I'm, I'm originally from. Okay. And where is that exactly? Um, well, it's, it's, do you, I mean, for, for you, I guess it's not too far away from Wimbledon. Do you know Wimbledon? <laughs> Only f- the, from tennis. Okay. So it's not too far away from there. Not the best neighborhood in London, but not, uh, not the worst either. Uh, probably when I was raised there was, it would be considered a lower middle class neighborhood. So it's London, you know, you grew up in one of the world, the centers of world, you know, culture and commerce. Um, maybe some of your friends made it to, uh, you know, into the finance sector, into the city of London. Maybe some of them are plumbers. Um, I guess you've, you know, you're, you're in your mid thirties now, so you've seen a lot of different trajectories. 
Um, yeah, we're, we're like um, trying to find a question, but it's interesting when you, because I, I also am from a, a financial capital city. And uh, I, I think people from financial capital cities, they have a different opportunity cost because you could just go home and work in the city of London or something like that. Whereas if you're from Ohio or whatever it is, um, you, you pretty much have to get out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, essentially, yes. But it's, it's changing now a little bit with the online world. But yes, I would agree with that statement. And um, oh, and uh, one other thing is your dad. Uh, you mentioned offhand that your dad is is of Scottish descent or maybe he's actually Scottish. Yes, my dad is Scottish. Yeah, from Glasgow. He's from Glasgow. And so I guess in some way he was an immigrant, too. Do you do you feel a, a connection to Scotland? I, yeah, I love Scotland. It's a great country. Um, I haven't been I haven't been back in a long time. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, my dad moved down from Scotland to London to try and get a better life. And then I left London to go to a tax haven to have a better life. So that's why I never I never begrudge anybody for, for making the move or trying to change things because we all are doing that most of the time, whether we realize it or we don't. And I definitely think now it's getting to the point where the world's changing. The Germans and the Brits and many other countries from Europe are now coming in mass, mass amounts of immigration is happening from Europe to South America and everything's a cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it's probably hit the inflection curve. Would you agree where Latin America is uh, finally starting to make sense again, even for ambitious people? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is Europe has failed a lot of its people, um, especially West Europe. You know, you, you live in the UK now and the government is talking about raising taxes when they're already taxing the middle class 40%. You know, and people like me, we're in the 45% tax bracket. So I have to work five months of the year to be able to pay the government. And then on, after I've done that, I have to figure a way to pay four or five thousand pound rents in London if I want a house. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's just not viable anymore for a lot of people. And I think that Europe has been living off its past for a long time. And a lot of people are starting to wake up now to the fact that it's not, it, you know, we have a lot of good, especially North America and West Europe, we have a lot of amazing self-marketing. You're, the, you're so lucky. This is the land of the free. Everywhere else is garbage. Everywhere else is dangerous. <laughs> not here. It's great. Pay your 50% tax so you can have free health care, <laughs> you know, and people fall for that. And they don't realize that actually there's a lot of stuff out there. And I remember on my first ever Brazil vlog, I filmed a supermarket. And I got five comments on Twitter under the video saying, I didn't know Brazil had supermarkets. And I thought, wow, you guys really, you know, a lot of people need to travel more. They really do. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you've had a lot of the same realizations that uh, I've had while traveling. Um, you've mentioned a couple of them before, certainly in your tweets and in previous interviews about, you know, families being more together. You've learned different uh, family dynamics uh, you've uh, what, what are some of your biggest epiphanies that you've learned while traveling? Well, first off was the, w w this is going to sound a bit strange, but uh, people that have traveled will know what I'm talking about. The first off was a cleanliness thing. So in a lot of countries, they don't wear shoes in the house first off, and then they, they wash after they go to the bathroom, which is not something that you do in North America or the UK. It's not. And that was like a big, Oh wow. People, live that way. And that's one of the best things about traveling. You learn very quickly what people do. The next thing was uh, family constructs. So I was kicked as soon as I told my dad, I didn't want to study. I was out of the house, um, which is normal in the UK, normal in the USA. It's either study and stay or get out and go get a job because they think they're helping the children. They think they're doing them a favor and they're going to be independent. Most children just end up treading water for five to 10 years because they can't get a good paying job. So they end up working for minimum wage and then they have to pay somebody else's parents rent. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it's really silly. So I, I realized in other countries, they didn't kick their kids out. And then I realized there was a happy medium because in some countries they'll literally say to their kids, oh, stay here till you're 50, who cares? And then in the UK, they're going, you're 16, get out. So something, some happy medium is what I will do with my kids for sure. And then I also realized as well in the UK, as soon as your parent or the person that raised you, you know, the person that raised you is considered a nuisance or, or something difficult, you know, 
the person that literally carried you for years of your life is a bit difficult. You, they kick them out in the UK and they send them to a home where they've got five TV channels and white bread sandwiches, like that's some sort of life. I mean, it's, I mean, if you do that because you physically have no option, you know, you, they need care or something, fair enough. If they're just a bit of a nuisance and you're, getting, you're kicking them out, unbelievable, shocking. And I realized in Vietnam, I, I genuinely with my eyes would see people carrying their elders over across rivers and stuff on their back. And I thought, that's how it's done. That's what I'm going to do with my dad. I'm going to take care of my dad until, he, until he's gone because that's what they deserve. Your parents did a good job for you, got to do it back for them. And we don't do that in, in the UK or the USA. It's really shocking. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I really like our, our mutual friend, Dylan Madden, previous podcast guest, would talk a lot about retiring his mom, uh, which is a super honorable thing that is just not on people's radar at all. And it, it really should be more so to take care of your parents. Absolutely. That's why I brought my I dad over. That's why I retired my dad and brought him over. I've had him on salary since 2014 because he was living a life in the UK where it looks normal to him, but from the outside, you can see how sad it is. The classic nine to five, the GMO garbage food in the UK, never seeing mm -hmm. the sun, coming home to his girlfriend, Big Susan, that he didn't even like but he's <laughs> with her because he's got no option. Do you know what I mean? The nagging, the moaning, the whinging, the complaining, you know, n sitting in his car for 30 minutes before going into the house because he knows he's about to have an argument. You know, all that stuff seems normal when you're in the UK. And when you leave it, you very quickly realize it isn't. So as soon as I got him on salary, he lived a couple of years in the UK and I said, Dad, I need you to come out. And he goes, oh, and he eventually agreed. And he said, I'll come out to Uruguay for three months and then I'll fly back and I'll do three months, three months. He came in 2016. He has not been back once. Not once. That's crazy. Yeah. Has no desire to. He's living a life of luxury in Argentina. I've got him taken care of financially. He's got a nice villa with a swimming pool. He spends his days doing whatever he wants to do. And that's exactly what he should be doing for the rest of his life. One of the, the questions on Twitter, because we asked uh, before this episode uh, questions for Lawrence. And one of them was... Can we get an update on what has become of Big Susan? And I didn't get it, but I think I get it now. But tell us a little bit about uh, Big Susan. So my dad had a girlfriend who was just, I mean, it's literally like the most TV series thing you could ever have. Just the classic. She was an Irish woman. She was like North Ir Northern Irish, which is still part of the UK. Very mm -hmm. angry, um, burly, big, strong woman. She could probably wrestle a bear. If you're at a picnic and a bear comes along, <laughs> I would put my money on Big Susan. I reckon she'd take the bear. And she basically just dominated my dad, dad's life. And it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about, your dad being dominated by a woman called Big Susan. But at the same time, <laughs> I get DMs from guys all the time in their 40s and 50s. And they say, they relate. Hey, hey, my friend, like, thank you for sharing your dad's story. It really helped me. I'm in the same position. I'm sleeping on the sofa. My girlfriend has told me that I don't want to go. She, uh, she doesn't want to sleep with me anymore. And I'm in the doghouse all the time. And I get treated like shit and I get no respect at home. And I see a lot of guys in the UK, especially in that position. And, you know, my dad's story, as uncomfortable as it might be sometimes to share, if that wakes up one or two people and saves their lives and they end up improving themselves and changing the situation, then that's worth it for me, you know? And uh, I know you've been getting a lot into uh, high ticket closing recently, uh, working with Rogue Wealth and others. Um, and uh, one one thing that you said that struck a chord with me is that the best way to sell is through storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And also, sh massive shout out to Rogue Wealth. He is the one that uh, took me from a decent salesperson to a very good salesperson. Um, he runs a program called the Dojo. I highly recommend anybody who's here to check that out. Cause he, he's the guy that I make a lot of money now on the phones, uh, much more than I used to. And it's thanks to him. So definitely a big shout out for him. And, uh, yeah, the best way to sell is by storytelling. And if people can see that story and think, Oh my God, I'm in that same position. Lawrence's dad is in, I get DMS all the time. What did your dad do? How did he do it? So he was with big Susan for 10 years, just controlling his life. And then one day 
I said to him, come over to Uruguay. And he'd had enough. And he woke up, he did his suitcase, he sat it down and he said, listen, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving, you know, because it was a real miserable relationship, you know, the sort of dominant where the woman leads and the man does everything she says and it's never enough. And he's constantly saying, I'm just trying to make her happy. I'm just trying to make And she's never happy. It's never enough. And uh, he, he just went, sold his car at nearly 60 years old and then flew out to Uruguay, flew out to Argentina and then moved to Uruguay with me. Yeah, and that's amazing. And so you've been uh, traveling with your dad to different countries and, and for quite a few years now. And I was just curious, the related question, like, have you ever had any of your friends from the UK come visit or be inspired by, by what you're doing and, you know, really, really try to um, do something similar? Um, I think you and Dylan, you guys have a lot of tweets where it's like, oh, you can't save anyone. You can't, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Has anyone really um, taken it seriously, though, and, and got the sort of inner motivation and, and made a move as well? No. Um, they think, because they're manipulated in their minds, they think that South America is all mud huts and everyone's running around with guns shooting each other and all this other stuff. They, they believe that because that's what they're told every single day by the the propaganda machine that is the UK. Here's the best mm -hmm. country. Foreigners are swimming here to get in. Oh, it's so great. Your free health care. Oh, you know, you're so lucky. Oh, everywhere else in the world is dangerous, but here is safe. You know, don't worry about the knife attacks in London and the acid attacks and the ridiculous crime rates and everything else. You're living great. And that's what they believe. They believe that in their heart of hearts. And so when I moved to South America, I got laughed at. And let me tell you now, a lot of people will go and get some statistic out or whatever. I've lived it. I have not been robbed once in South America in the nearly 10 years that I've been here. And I was not robbed in Asia for the four years in total that I lived there. So it's, it's a complete myth that it's unbelievably dangerous. There are places that are dangerous that bring the statistics up, certain cities, you know, like say Rio, Rio de Janeiro. But if you live in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and the south of Brazil, you have a much safer existence than you do living in the UK. And I've done both. So I can testify to that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, maybe one thing that helps is that you don't drink. How long have you not been drinking for? I realized drinking was a scam. And again, I do drink occasionally. Sometimes I'll have a bit of wine if I'm in an Italian restaurant or I, I on flight sometimes. I, I, I hate turbulence. So I'll have a drink just to calm me down. But I don't drink as in, you know, like going out drinking and all that stuff. I realized it was a scam in the UK very early on. I realized mm -hmm. that it basically, it's pushed in your face from a young age. Most people don't even really enjoy it. They just think they do. And, you know, you start off having a couple of beers on a weekend and it very quickly turns into getting absolutely blind drunk Friday, blind drunk Saturday, some beers on a barbecue Sunday, and then a couple of beers after work every day. Before you know it, you're an alcoholic, but you're not really an alcoholic because society doesn't label you as one when it should. Mm -hmm. So I realized there very quickly that it was a bit of a scam and I just sort of stayed away from it, which is one of the best things I ever did. And a lot of people say I look younger than my age. I don't know if that's true or not, but I get that a lot. And I believe that's down to clean living, a lot of sun and no alcohol. So you're in like your, your mid thirties now, when you were turning 30, you know, you, you, you talk a lot to, to people in their twenties and inspire them to make mistakes in their twenties. And then uh, I guess you kind of talk to a lot to people in their forties and say, Hey, if you're unhappy with your life, um, you know, make a move, stop living in a depressing city. But what about people in their thirties and especially their early thirties? What would your advice be for, for them? That's a good one because I don't really give too much advice for that age range, I guess, because I'm still figuring it out maybe. <laughs> Whereas with mm -hmm. the 20s, I saw it myself. And then with the 40s and 50s, I saw it with my dad so I can kind of help. With 30s, I would just say that if you haven't got your life together in your 30s, that's not great. You know, it's very uncomfortable because people will look at you strange. But fix it. If there are any problems, fix them because it only gets harder as you get older. You know, it's okay. When I went to China and I had no money, I looked normal because I was 23 years old. If I went back and did that story again and I'm selling juice nearly at, you know, my mid-30s, I, I would look weird. 
I would look out of place. You know what I mean? So I think it's very important to fail quickly and put yourself out there. And then what I would say also to people in their 30s, if you can see yourself going in the direction that my father was in, that sort of direction, if you're in the UK and you see your relationship kind of go that way, do make the changes, do the things. Inject that you while you can do. before before the golden handcuffs get too strong. Yes, exactly. Before you know it, you know, I've seen it so many times with my dad and UK friends. Before you know it, you're sleeping on the sofa and you're in the dog house and all this other stuff, you know, which is just completely insane. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, like we mentioned before, you're one of the only people that I know that spent such a significant amount of time in each of the, the countries in the Southern cone of, uh, of, uh, Latin America in the Mercosur region. Um, I, I guess there's not enough time to really kind of do a, a detailed breakdown on all of them, but how do you think about this region and what do you, what do you really enjoy about this region? I love the attitude of the people. I love the laid back culture. I love the fact that in South America, we don't have the, we don't have the sort of manipulation machine that the, the West has, you know, where they'll make a, 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 they'll do some propaganda and everyone will go and they'll change their Twitter bios to it and they'll scream and they'll shout and all this other stuff. And people, Democrats and Republicans, oh, I hate you. Here in America, in South America, they, they have that stuff to an extent, but it's not as strong. So you can still just be you. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to, you know, bow down to these things that they tell you that you have to bow down to. And, you know, you, people don't really care. They're, tr they're too busy trying to live their lives and feed their kids. They're not really interested in controlling your thoughts and all this other stuff. You know what I mean? People just are not there yet, which is great. Um, I also love the fact that everything you want is here. You know, like I said before, seas, uh, lakes, mountains, whatever you're looking for is here. You've got tropical, you've got cold, you've got everything. You know what I mean? You've got incredible mm -hmm. food in Peru. You've got world-class steak in Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, south of Brazil. You've got amazing seafood in the north of Brazil. You know, you've got great stuff everywhere to enjoy. You know what I mean? You've got dangerous places, unbelievably safe places as well. You've got tax havens. You've got everything. Do you know what I mean? Everything that you could possibly want is here. That's why I haven't really, I went to Europe for a, a bit as a, on, on a holiday, but aside from that, I haven't really left because I don't feel the need to. Yeah, I definitely think it's one of the most underrated regions, that Southern Cone. Um, you talked about uh, tax havens briefly. Um, people uh, certainly asked about that in the questions. If you had to do redo your whole business setup or redo your life setup, in terms of Latin America, what would you do differently? What do you mean? As in my tax situation? Yeah, I suppose maybe like the residency or the taxes or where to base up or maybe, uh, maybe I don't know, maybe you've switched accountants a couple of times along the way and you've, you've made tweaks here and there. I was very lucky. I did it perfectly. I mean, I went to Uruguay and Uruguay took such great care of me. I mean, they had back in 2013, they had secrecy banking. They had... I mean, unbelievable. I remember I went into the tax office. I went to a small town and this woman said to me, oh, I know, I know, because I'd never seen someone like me before because it was a small town. Most mm -hmm. people were doing it in the capital, Montevideo. And she said, you don't want to pay tax anymore, do you? I said, no, no, no. And she said, oh, I can help you. You need to do this, this, and this. And uh, she said to me one day, she said, Lawrence, the UK has called for you twice asking about you. And no I said, way. Really? really? And she said, yeah, but I don't tell them anything because I'm not allowed to because they had secrecy banking. I said, oh, okay, what do you tell them? She said, I just tell them that you're a tax resident of our country and I can't give them any more information at this time. <laughs> I just thought, you guys, <laughs> you guys are awesome. Honestly, thank Legends. you. Legends. <laughs> Legends, honestly. Yeah, shout out to her in the tax office. So it was, um, I did it perfectly. I wouldn't do it again. If I was to do it now, I would probably do Paraguay but again, Uruguay, if you're moving large sums of money into South America, um, which I have done over the years, Uruguay is just much more friendly for that. Paraguay has I, like I would agree with certain, that. certain limits and things like that. Uruguay, I've moved large sums of money and they've never even batted an eyelid. How are you uh, preparing for fatherhood and how do you think that fatherhood's going to change you? Um, I'm, I'm working on every flaw that I have because I want to be the best possible example that I can be. Um, fortunately, you know, I'm an old, I'm an old bastard now. So 
I had any bad habits I had in my twenties and all that failing has turned me into quite a responsible individual now. So I'm quite lucky in that regard. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm just excited for it really. I mean, first year is going to be difficult, you know, with, uh, as it is, and it's going to be good. You know, I, I think as well, I'm very glad that it's happening, you know, now because I can homeschool the child. I can teach the child sales. I can teach the child boxing. I can teach him all these different skills that are really going to help him. And, you know, with the last two years as well, teach him not to listen to certain things, you know, do your own, have your own thoughts, think your own things. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much how it's going to change me. I'm just working on every little mini floor I have just so I can be the best example. All right. I wanted to make a note at this point in the episode that we're actually recording an additional segment later in the day. Lawrence was gracious enough to give us some more time. So if it doesn't flow with the previous hour of the conversation, that's just because we're recording a little bit later in the day, but very gracious of Lawrence to give us uh, another window of time. So appreciate that, Lawrence. No problem. Happy to be back. Absolutely. And um, I'll kick it off with a question about how you had not been back to the UK for close to 10 years. And I believe uh, when you did your little uh, vacation in uh, Spain and Portugal, you did visit London for the first time in a very long time. That must have been sort of a a surreal and uh, very interesting moment, right? To sort of revisit uh, your, your home country. It was. Um, and to be honest, when I left the UK, I was struggling financially and now I'm fortunately comfortably comfortable financially. So it was a different, it was a slightly different experience. I got to stay in better hotels, eat better food and all that stuff. But it was just, uh, you could just see how depressing the, the, the life was, you know, people running around, scattering around, extremely high cost of living, lots of pressure. Nobody really looked very happy. And, uh, the food obviously wasn't very good. And then I was also shocked at how expensive London was. Um, you know, if you live in London and you want to have a very good quality of life, you need to have a lot of money. I put it out on Twitter that you need at least 200,000. And I got, <laughs> I got a bit of uh, hate from people saying, no, I only make 50,000 and I live well. And it's like, well, you don't really. Because, you know, you make 200,000, you lose 100,000 pretty much to tax um, and national insurance. And then if you, you know, you're left with 8,000 a month and then you can easily spend 3,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds on renting a house. And then you have a few thousand to spend across the month. You know, you're not living really even that well then. It was quite shocking to see. And I I think one of the things that's cool about Latin America and geo-arbitrage is these small luxuries uh, that technically you could afford in the UK or the US, you can. It, it just becomes much more accessible in Latin America. For example, having a live-in or having a, a, a maid, having um, a chef, getting massages every week, going to uh, top-end restaurants, eating steak at restaurants. These are things that even if you could technically afford it in the UK or the US, you'd still kind of feel bad about it or you'd be like, this is insane how much I'm spending. Um, but in Latin America, it's just it's just a fraction of the price. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people make the comparison, right? They say, oh, but the, the locals don't earn that much and all this other stuff. So I guess there's always that, right? But, you know, in, in London, I just remember that when I was a kid, you know, the average person could, with a normal salary, could have a house and live a normal life. And that's just not the case anymore. You know, an average small little house is like a million and a half pounds, you know, and uh, salaries haven't really gone up that much. So it's, 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 it's just not the same. Do you ever uh, think of yourself in the vein of um, uh, the British tradition of Victorian explorers? I'm not sure how much of a fan of history you are, but do you ever go back and read about, um, you know, the, the Victorian era or, or different eras of British history and sort of think of yourself in that way at all? To be honest, no. What I think of is I think you should always go where your best chance of having your best life is. And I will explain that to my children because now Paraguay is having a boom period. South America is having a boom period. Europe mm-hmm. is falling very fast. 
And um, to be honest, I think that, you know, just because Paraguay's people make the mistake of thinking that things are going to be the way they are forever, you know, and Europe is a prime example of that. Dining out on old reputations, making stupid decisions, raising taxes, you know, embracing essentially a form of communism. And then when people have had enough and they move to South America, they just keep going. And, and you know, because the amount of, of people that arrived in Paraguay from Germany over the last year, you, you wouldn't believe it. it's incredible. And uh, I, it, just because Paraguay is in a, on, a, on the rise now doesn't always mean it is. I mean, I could buy a house and plan a life here, and then in 20 years' time, they do something crazy. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's always best to have your options open and just understand that we live in a world where you can travel anywhere, the drop of a hat, especially if you've got online income, and go wherever is best for you. Interesting. Um of course, I'm, I'm very familiar with the go where you're treated best uh, idea, but I wanted to just double down on that. And I mean, we we have such a long tradition of how, you know, a British guy was the first person to summit Mount Everest, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, I think, um, you know, North Pole, South Pole, um, long tradition of, of discovering new lands, discovering the source of the Nile, things like that. Do you do you think of yourself at all in, in that sort of poetic way, uh, in a bit of a less logical and a more romantic sense of what it means to be British? Could you ever see yourself moving back there, maybe in like your, your 60s or something and joining the clubs on Mayfair and hobnobbing with, uh, you know, I don't know, politicians and stuff like that? I'm not sure about that. But what I would say is, is I went back to London for only a few days and I couldn't hack it. I found it very difficult mentally to hack. When everything is gray, everybody looks miserable, the food is terrible. Food doesn't, uh, to be honest, I was quite shocked. And um, when we went back, we could both visually see that the food wasn't really genuinely real. You know, you've traveled yourself. You know, when you go to South America, the flavors of the food taste much, you know, they're much more intense because it's real. It's not fake. It's not some GMO con- contraption that, you know, some long life thing full of preservatives and chemicals. It's real food. So when you, I went you're back not to the UK, first person to, to comment this. We had uh, Francis Amelia on the podcast, another uh, Twitter fitness guy. And uh, he's from Liverpool. And uh, he moved to Venezuela. And he says it's just night and day. It's real food down there in Venezuela. And when his Venezuelan girlfriend came to the UK uh, to visit the family, it was the first thing she noticed was it was just, you know, the tomatoes were the wrong color. The meat wasn't the right texture. It just didn't, it's just, it just tasted very different. Everything. Exactly that. And shout out to him as well. He's an absolute legend. I love that guy. He's a great couple as well. Nice, nice, nice couple. Um, it's exactly that. Everyone I know who's gone to the UK said the food doesn't taste of anything. And it's not because of seasoning or whatever. It's just genuinely because the food is not real. Um, so I found it very difficult when I went back and, you know, I, I have the money to spend, but at the same time, why would I go to the UK, to London to live in that sort of misery and spend like 1000 pounds a day to live in a nice hotel or, you know, eat out every night the way I want to. I mean, every taxi you get is 40, 50 pounds, you know, 30 pounds, 50 pounds, depending on where you're going. And, you know, if, if for me to have the same life, of let's say I wanted let's say I was here in Asuncion and I want to live in a five star hotel, so I go and live in Dazzler or Sheraton, one of the ones on the main strip. It's only going to cost me like two grand a month to live in a five star hotel. Now let's say I want to eat out every single day and I want to enjoy myself. It's only going to cost me fifty dollars to do that. So now for three thousand five hundred dollars, I'm living in a five star hotel and I'm eating out every day for lunch and dinner very well. Now you imagine that in London, a decent hotel, a five star hotel is probably six, seven hundred pounds a night. Then if I want to go out and eat out every day, you're looking at another few hundred with the taxis and everything else, easily a thousand. So the, the difference is like three to four thousand to thirty to forty thousand, you know, and and then what do they offer in exchange? Okay, supposed free healthcare. That's another thing as well. My girlfriend's pregnant. I got the best package for the for the birth you know five star level suite everything taken care of anything that she needs she gets two thousand and something dollars for the whole thing you know 
it, it's the whole thing is really like I was saying earlier in the podcast is very much self marketing. We're the best. You have the best healthcare. Don't leave here. It's fantastic. Everywhere else is dangerous. You know, and as soon as you start unraveling that, you very quickly find out it's not really true. And I don't blame them for doing it. I wouldn't want to lose my taxpayers either. But the reality is far from what they say it is. I think the one thing that can be said for being in a place like London or Boston or Toronto is that the IQ is generally much higher and that generally people are more successful. They're certainly much more robotic and they all have the sweater vest and basically just look like clones. But in in one certain regard, you know, they are more likely to be college educated and just smarter in general. And it it can be palpable sometimes. Like when I uh, travel up from Latin America and pop into Boston to see family members and, you know, converse with people that went to Harvard and MIT. Um, I'm kind of like, damn, part of me is like, I, maybe I should be here so I can be around genuinely smart people, uh, that, uh, you know, (laughs) are, are really sort of closer to cutting edge innovation and science and technology. How do you, how do you think about that? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't know what to say on that, to be honest. I, um, as far as IQs go, I find that it's a very interesting thing because if you go somewhere where there's no education and no TV, they could be considered with a low IQ by an IQ test standards, but they know loads of stuff on how to treat things and all sorts of stuff about the earth and things that we don't really understand. Um, so I find it's, it's very interesting because you'll, I remember when I first went traveling, I had my own perspective of what life should be like and what is the done thing. And since traveling for nearly two decades now, my worldview is completely different of, of, you know, what an IQ even is. There's, there's certainly different types of intelligence. I think, um, mastering your body, be it through, um, uh, dance or through martial arts is certainly a way. Um, I think, you know, people in Latin America definitely have much better social intelligence and just know how to behave better. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the traditional IQ test really is, um, you know, it's, it's what they say it is, but I think, I think one thing that's important in life is always look at results because we get very tied down in belief systems. And I try not to do that. I try to look at who's winning. You know, if people are living to 120 in some tribe somewhere, what are they doing? What, how are they doing that? You know what I mean? Steak. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or whatever it is, right? And like if people are making millions, how are they doing it? If people are driving a really nice car, how are they doing it? If people, you know, have really good, you know, physiques, how are they doing it? Do you know what I mean? Like I, I kind of look at life like that, like who has the results? Mm-hmm. Opinions and belief sets really don't matter. It's who's winning at the end of it all. Who, who are some of your biggest influences? Like who, if they put out a, an article or an interview, uh, et cetera, will you stop everything and, and read their material? Or who have been some of your, historically been uh, some of your big influences or the people that you've sort of modeled yourself after? Um, nobody famous, I would say, um, very few famous people. It's mostly people I've met that I see are winning and I find out what they're doing and ask them questions and I tend to take their, their views a lot more seriously, but there aren't too many people that I sort of listen to on on sort of everything or I'd stop what I'm doing. It's quite interesting that question. I never really thought about it, but there aren't really. And um, I had a question for you about language learning. Um, I think my understanding is your, your Spanish is definitely pretty good and uh, your Portuguese as well. Uh, what part of, uh, how, how big of a role has that played in your, in your journey learning the local language? It's massive. And I, I get often, I often get asked this question on Twitter. Oh, I want to move to South America. Do I have to learn Spanish? And I think, what are you doing? Well, of course you should learn Spanish. Um, I recommend the Pimsler program for anybody that does want to learn a language. Uh, it's every I speak four languages fluently. 
and every single one bar English was learned via the Pimsleur program. Um, I, uh, for me, it was CDs that I learned these language on. Now it would be some sort of app. But uh, I definitely recommend the Pimsleur program. The FBI well, used it. What's the fourth? It. Is it Italian? Yes. And I guess you would rank them in ter- like Spanish best, Portuguese second best, Italian third? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And like I imagine you're quite good. Like when, you, when you're when you strolling around uh, Paraguay and Uruguay, are you uh, primarily able to speak to Spanish and people? I guess you don't go to the bar much, but if you go strike up conversations with people at the bar or things like that, you can you can totally get through like hour long conversations, joking around in Spanish and all that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm completely fluent. And to be honest, it's been so long now that I should be. I mean, it's been nearly 10 years. Mm hmm. So I've almost spent, you know, a third of my life uh, speaking Spanish now. So, yeah, it's, it's very easy. But I recommend anyone that does come and wants to learn, I would say the Pimsleur program gives you a good enough base where you can have sort of conversations. And the next thing, you have to practice and listen and, 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 and really emerge yourself. I was quite lucky because when I went to Venezuela, nobody spoke English. Nobody had ever seen an Englishman. So I was forced to learn. If I wanted to sell that juice, I had to learn. And on my first day of selling juice, all I could really say was juice and the price. Juguito. Yeah. Jugo de caña, <laughs> guarapo de caña, cinco bolívares. That's all I could really say. And if they tried to have any sort of conversation with me, I couldn't really talk to them. And, you know, from being – the best thing you can always do, people's biggest problem is they always want a course for something or a life hack that's going to save them lots of time. When in reality, that ends up taking all their time because they do all these courses and they try for these hacks. When really, if you just really emerged yourself into something, you would learn extremely quickly, whatever it is. It would be like trying to drive a car, but only doing courses and then planning on driving the car. And then next year on January 1st, I'll start driving cars. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really make sense. Was learning the languages a big motivation for your travels? Did you travel in order to learn or was it just sort of a a byproduct or thing you had to do? It was a byproduct of just leaving the UK. I mean, the goal has always been leave the UK at any cost. (laughs) And if I had to learn a lot of the language, I was prepared to do that just to get out of there. But you did, you know, you were moving around every couple months. Um, you know, you're, you you went all over the Southern Cone, visiting all the different countries. What motivated you to do that? Because there's lots of people, I have tons of friends, they, they f- flew to their first destination in Mexico, and they just stayed in that spot for years. And so wow. not everyone necessarily, once they find something better than their home country is, is jumping around a lot. Was it, were you interested in the nature and, and doing dope shit in nature or just kind of, like what, what kind of motivated you to, to keep exploring? Well, I think it's very important to know all your options. You know, if, if a country that you're living in does something crazy, like, I don't know, lock down the entire economy for two years um, and you want to go somewhere where there's a bit more freedom, um, then you want to know where's good and you want to have a list. Like I've always got a list of backup places and I've got a list of places. I like to travel depending on what I'm doing. So... When I lived in Uruguay, I would go to Colonia for deep work, for example, and then I would go to Punta del Este for the beach in the summer, and then I'd go up to Brazil when it was cold. You know what I mean? So I kind of had a tactical approach to, to where I'm living and what I'm doing. And I think if you're traveling as well, one thing I'd like to suggest for people that are looking into the digital nomad life is to not travel like too much, like every three, four days change city. And then also just plan for a deep work period. I have my cities where I know they're not, they're not too crazy. They're nice and chill and I can go there and do some deep work if needs be and get that deep work out of the way and then go and travel again. Yeah, definitely makes sense. That was actually an excellent answer. You basically travel to expand your options. And so I imagine you just have a list of cities that you think are going to be cool that you think you're going to enjoy and you're almost basically doing scouting missions. Exactly. And like I say, in this world now, it's extremely difficult to plan anything. I mean, we just saw over the last two years, I mean, they were like Germany. They were measuring people in the streets, and they were kicking people's doors in for celebrating Christmas in the UK. I mean, it's very hard to plan 
on where you're going to be for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years now. You, you could do that 30 years ago. It's very hard to do that now. So you want to know all your options, what the banking system's like, how good is the food, could you stay there for three months if things go crazy? You know, it's very good to have those sort of options. And I've got a massive array of cities and countries where I can go, a few different residencies. You know, I'm working on the passports as well, trying to get more passports. And, um, you know, you need that in this day and age. You really do. So uh, what are your top cities? You can feel free to uh, keep a couple off the records that you don't want to share, but... Um... What are some of your your top cities, and then uh, you know what what utility do those particular cities have? Okay, so I would say uh, Buenos Aires is a good city right now. It's fun. It's very cheap. I like Colonia in Uruguay. It's a very chill place. It's very you know built by Swiss colonists. It's a beautiful place. Very chill. So I like that for deep work. In Brazil, if I'm going to the beach or something, I, I really like Maragogi, and which is just south of Recife. Really safe, unbelievable beaches, tropical, just great. Um, Florianopolis in the south of Brazil as well, Balneario, which I prefer, ne- which is next to it. Um, Asuncion is also a, a nice city. It depends. Like I, I know a lot of foreigners that come here and they want something a bit more. You know, it's it's a small city here. It's almost like a, a town, almost. You know, so people sometimes want a bit more fun, but Asuncion's an, a nice, chill place. The north of Chile I also quite like as well. Uh, south of Chile is very beautiful. So I would say those are probably my favorite kind of places in um, uh, Gramado in Brazil as well. Those are, are pretty much my favorite. Arequipa in Peru as well is very nice, especially for deep work. So those are probably my my sort of go-to places do you find in Brazil you're able to do any deep work anywhere or or is that the the recreation spots? Gramado is a very good place if you're looking to do deep work. It's it's a yeah, if you if you haven't seen sure. Gramado, if you're listening but to other, this now, but anywhere on the beach anywhere <laughs> anywhere yeah, on the beach No, but beach you still you still can, but yeah, like I check out Gramado honestly. If you're listening to this, you won't believe what Gramado looks like. It, it, it's incredible. Google it. Once you've listened to this and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Beautiful, very safe. And then on the beach, yeah, I mean, it's it depends where you are. Like, I'm not a big fan of Rio. I didn't like Rio very much. Um, didn't feel safe. And very similar to the UK, if you don't feel safe somewhere, it's hard to enjoy it. Um, but, yeah, the, the Maragogi is very, very safe. Nothing happens there, and uh, I, I strongly recommend anyone who wants to go for a nice tropical beach vacation to, to check it out. And when you're trying to go to the south of Brazil from Uruguay, are you taking a bus or are you flying? I'd fly that, yeah, for sure. Not a bus guy? I mean, if you did a bus from Asuncion to the beach in Brazil... No, you'd Uruguay, like, from, your, from like Montevideo to Porto Alegre or something. That's still, that's still like 25 hours because it's so big, <laughs> right? It's not like Europe where... You can be in one country to another in a couple of hours. It's it's massive. I think the bus from I've done the bus once. I think from Porto Alegre to uh, Montevideo to Porto Alegre, and it was like twenty hours. Okay, damn. <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> like that. And they've got nice buses here, right? So people are hearing this and thinking bus and thinking of something really. You know, they've got nice seats, like the equivalent of business class on a plane. That's what they've got on the buses here, but. It's still 20 hours, you know what I mean? Yeah, Brazil has a really good bus culture, and I think uh, a lot of South America as well. It's not like a greyhound in the States. It's, it's, it's quite a bit nicer than that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on gringos in general, and do you try to avoid gringo heavy, heavy cities, or um, are you as repulsed by them as Jake Nomada, or you, are you generally okay <laughs> with them? The thing is, I... I, I, I don't know. I, I'm happy for anyone that discovers South America. I'm happy for you. If you are living in Ohio and that's your reality, you know, no offense to Ohio, but you know what I mean, or Detroit or whatever, and you discover that you can fly th- four hours down south and live in a tropical paradise and enjoy your life, I'm happy for you. I'm genuinely happy for you because I did the same thing. So I would never begrudge anyone for doing what I've done. 
But at the same time, I do try and avoid cities where it's just mass gringos. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just, it's almost like, it's kind of like Thailand in Asia, you know, where Bangkok is just full of foreigners and it kind of loses its authenticity. I, I quite like places like Asuncion that still have their their culture and, and you know, very authentic cities and are not overrun by tourism. Definitely. Um, are you able to talk about uh, residencies and passports at all? Or is I, yeah. I know you're open about it. Some people aren't. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to. I mean, I can't give financial advice, but yeah, I'm more than happy to uh, to discuss that. No problem. I mean, being from the UK is, is fantastic because you can leave and your passport is strong and the UK government doesn't come after you for tax once you've left mm-hmm. after six months. They, right. they accept the fact that they've lost. Now, the USA will tax you regardless. Double taxation is in place. So very lucky we don't have that. And I don't want to, you know, disrupt that situation by becoming a Paraguayan and maybe they they decide to tax me or something like that. So it's very easy, actually, to, I mean, I saw someone, I mean, this is not advice, but I saw someone say something extremely true the other day that you can literally overstay your visa in a country. And because you're on a tourist visa, you don't owe them tax in certain situations. So there's so many different ways around these systems that, that people aren't even aware of. Yeah, I think that was my tweet. <laughs> that was yours. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yours. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was you. Yeah. It was like the Eddie Murphy uh, thinking meme. And it was like, if I just overstay by two years, I only pay a $100 fine on exit. Yeah, and that's exactly true, right? Like that, that, that's 100% true. They won't come for income tax during that time. So, mm-hmm. because you were not an official citizen. So, you know, and then again, it, it's, it's, so there's lots of different ways around these things. And I think people from America and the UK, we kind of think of everything as this is how it is. And then when you start traveling, you realize and you get that, that sort of, because again, in, in the UK or Canada or America, if you want to break the rules, you need to be in the top 1% and they'll allow you to break the rules. When you start traveling, the game gets much fairer very fast. Yeah, definitely a, a Tate a Tate principle right there. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he says that exactly, and it's a hundred percent true. You know. It's, yeah, and it's... also you don't you don't know everything about these other systems until you start on the path. And basically, what happens is the options and and the options and possibilities open to you while you're already on the path, but you won't know unless you start. Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. And it, 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 it's really eye opening. And at first you kind of go, wow, this is crazy. This is corruption. I can't believe it because you've never seen it before. Because the only people that will have seen it are the mega rich in your country. And then suddenly you're in a position where you can buy your freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, during and, uh, just just to double down for it, um, obviously, Americans tax on worldwide taxation. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's very helpful to any listeners that are from non-USA, ca- Canadian listeners, UK, Australia, mainland Europe listeners, etc., to just know that you can b- break your tax residency in your home country. You can get set up somewhere else, and I think that's that's been one of the um, uh, one of the things that's helped you grow a lot on on Twitter and with your brand is that you're one of the few people that's been. Uh, so candid and open about this and inspiring people and just basically helping give people the permission to do it themselves because they can say, hey, if Lawrence did it, you know, that's just a, a really good anecdote. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and one thing I will always say is since opening a Twitter account from Twitter alone, I've generated millions of dollars over the two, three years I've been on it, which is nice, but it's nowhere near as nice as the handful of people that say, hey, I moved to a tax haven, thank you, I'm no longer paying tax and I love my life. Or the people that say, yeah, I was in a very similar relationship to your dad with Big Susan, I made the decision to leave, I'm now in Thailand, I'm having the time of my life. And it's those people that I might have helped during my two, three years that really I'll remember, you know, when it's all said and done. What are uh, some of the things that you're most proud of about your journey so far? I'm very proud of the fact that as a scared 18, 20, 21, 22 year old boy, I took the risks and 
I just went with it and uh, I rode things out and I, I made decisions that were tough. It would have been very easy for 19 year old me to be sat in an office in the UK doing the rat race, squeezing into the metro, the subway, as you would call it in America, going to my job, hating my life, getting myself a big Susan and, and, and living my life that way. But the fact that 18 year old me had the balls to get a backpack and a thousand euros and go to Italy and, and decide that that was it. I'm very proud of that because I'm very proud of him because a lot of people in their forties, fifties are scared to make that jump. You know, even when they've got money, I get, I get people who say, I'm retired now, but I'm so worried. I want to go to Paraguay, but I don't know what to, I don't even know where to start. 18 years old, backpack, never look back. And, you know, that's, that's been a, that's been something that kind of helped me. Cause if you, if you may, if you, I didn't have internet money young, like a lot of these guys, young guys do now, which I'm very jealous of. Cause if I'd had that as well, I would have been unstoppable, mm-hmm. but you know, being able to make those mistakes and take those risks enabled me to be comfortable in my thirties and that's priceless. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel the same way where I feel like I got into it just maybe like five years too late and how much I would have been crushing it if I got the poison out a couple of years earlier. Well, at least you're here. You know what I mean? That's the main thing. It's better to understand that you you're here now. Some people never make it, you know? And it's very sad. I mean, my dad, he thought everything was normal until he was nearly 60. And then that's when he went, I'm not doing this anymore. Do you know what I mean? It was, that was his breaking point, 60. Imagine if his breaking point had been 40 instead. You know what I mean? But it's better that at least happens instead of never happening. Yeah, absolutely. So you're the, uh, the founder of Raging Bull Coffee, um, a, a brand of extremely strong coffee. Uh, <laughs> that and you 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 basically put together this company, um, and a, a lot of my understanding is a lot of like the packaging and distribution and stuff happens in the states. What was it like to build this sort of U.S. based company from abroad, especially like a physical product where you got to source the beans somehow, you got to I don't know get it all packaged up, you got to bring it warehouses this and that. What w- what was that experience like? Well, it was the only difficulty was that it was during COVID that I launched that that brand. Um, so it took ages. It took so long to get it off the ground. But other than that, it's been smooth sailing. Uh, the, you know, it's got a lot of customers over the last year and a half. People enjoy it. And, um, you know, it's got very good reviews and everything else. So I'm definitely going to be taking that brand and, and growing it out. I've had some difficulty with Amazon as well. Um, I got suspended on my final account, so it's been kind of difficult getting another one back open. But I will figure that out and and grow that out on Amazon as well. And uh, if you like strong coffee, definitely give it a try. And uh, yeah, so the beans are a mix of African and Colombian, and uh, it's it's freshly roasted when you order. So we freshly roast the beans when you order them. So when they arrive to you, literally the mailmen say that, wow, I can't believe how good this smells because it's literally just been roasted the day before. So it's not like supermarket coffee where it might have been roasted three, four months ago. It's freshly roasted the day before. That's a hell of a pitch. Um, and are you shipping <laughs> internationally or just the States? Just the States, unfortunately. I'd love to ship internationally, but it's too much hassle from the United States. Um, you know, people are going to have to spend $30 extra to get their coffee and it's just not viable. Okay, so I have an idea for you, Lawrence. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for it. Let's start a Yerba Mate brand, our own brand of Yerba Mate. In Paraguay. <laughs> we're gonna, in Paraguay? We're gonna sor- yeah, we're gonna source it down uh, in the Encarnacion area. Uh, we're gonna, you know, uh, get a get a logo somehow, maybe from the same guys as Raging Bull. Uh, we're gonna, you know, find a, a manufacturer, and we're gonna perhaps export it, uh, maybe, maybe drop ship it or sell it on Amazon, drop ship it, whatever, FBA it in the States, in the UK, who knows? Cause all I know, maybe this will inspire you to look at it afterwards is that, um, like a, a, a half kilo of Yerba Mate in the U S or Canada is like $20. And as you probably know, in, in Paraguay, it's like a dollar 50. 
And so I feel like there's a bit of margin there. I mean, we can definitely look at that at some point for sure. What would, what would that look like if I can get some free game real quick? What would that look like to, to put together a company like that? I, I mean, uh, there's a lot better brand people out there than me. I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where – I'd have to look at that. I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, I use suppliers in the United States for my coffee that, you know, already imported and, uh, you know, I was able to get facilities and everything else. But, yeah, for, you, for, you, for that, I wouldn't even know where to start, to be honest. Okay. Well, I'm just planting the seeds of an idea. Okay. <laughs> when, I, when I get when I get down to when I get down to Paraguay, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk more about it. I'm definitely uh, I'm hoping to be down maybe by uh, maybe for uh, you'll be there for a Carnival, hopefully. Um, yeah, I'm not in, leaving uh, in February. I'm going to be here. I'm, I'm here permanently now, so I'm not leaving. That's awesome, man. Um, dude, the squad in Paraguay is growing rapidly. Um, oh, one last question. I, I got to ask this. Over the years, uh, you must have met a lot of the guys off Twitter in person. What have been some of your your favorite uh, memorable meetups, and who have you met o- over the years? Well, definitely Dylan Madden. Um, I've traveled to many countries with him. I've also met. I mean, I met a lot of everyone I met from Twitter was great. Um, I met Nima in London; he was awesome. I met. Um, I met Scott in Medellin and uh, a couple other guys as well. I, I was in a restaurant here the, the other night in Asuncion and there was a group of followers on the table next to me that had moved to Paraguay upon my recommendation. Um, <laughs> so I see a lot of people that, that follow me on Twitter, which is great. I'm very happy for them. I always am. You know, if you've moved from, like I keep saying, if you've moved from somewhere like Germany or the UK and you, you now live in a sunny place, you know, with great food and and a much better dating culture then I'm, I'm over the moon for you. So yeah, not, not too many sort of influences from Twitter, but I've met a lot of, a lot of people that, uh, that follow, which I, which I always appreciate. And we met briefly one time. And we met as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck to you in, uh, this upcoming summer in Ascension. It's, it's usually a hot one. Hopefully you make it out to San Bernardino or, uh, somewhere to, to pass it with ease. Absolutely. I'm sure I will. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us on this episode, man. Hopefully this appearance will help you um, rank above uh, Larry King, the American TV announcer when it comes to SEO. <laughs> Hopefully. Here's, here's hoping. Um, but yeah, man, thank you uh, so much for your time. Certainly appreciate it. I know the fans are, are going to love this one. Um, would you like to, to shout out, uh, I guess your Twitter handle and, and anything else that you'd like to promote? Yeah. One thing I'd love to shout out is my Instagram. It's at Lawrence King. Yes. I'm trying to grow that out. I'm posting a lot more lifestyle content over there. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, please do. I'd be very grateful and uh, shout out to you guys as well. You've been growing your account for, for a long time. I've seen you around the space. Always good. Bringing awareness to Latin America and showing just how good it is breaking some of the stereotypes, the unjust stereotypes. And uh, thanks very much for having me on.